Great. Well, today we're here to interview a university president, Mark Schlissel, and discuss his first 100 days in office as the university's 14th president. Welcome, President Schlissel, to the Michigan Daily Newsroom. Thanks. This is great. We're glad to have you. Uh, Claire, do you want to go ahead and get us started? Yeah, so after your first 100 days, it's kind of passed now, you've met with lots of students and alumni and university units. What have been your biggest takeaways so far? Well, yeah, I think probably the one biggest thing is the degree of passion that everybody has. Everybody is really excited, committed, um, just enthusiastic. Um, everyone feels the university is theirs. And that, that feeling is great. It's at all different levels. It's students and alums and faculty, even staff. Um, even folks that are critical of the university and are unhappy about things that we're doing, um, I always get the sense that their criticism has a, it isn't negative. It's they want to make the place better because they love the place. So that's one thing that was really exciting for me to, to find out. Another thing which was a little surprising uh, about students um, is the students are happy here than I, happier here than I thought they would be. And the reason why is to me, I would think that the bigger the place, the harder it is to kind of find your place in the big place. Um, but I get the sense that students here, almost all students here, find a way to make the big place small. And they find their own things like, you know, working here at the paper or being part of a fraternity or a sorority or an acapella group or theater or you know, something, but folks find ways to take advantage of the breath but chop it down into a, a much more homey kind of feeling place. And I think that leads to very happy students, so that's really good. Um, the alumni, it turns out, have absolutely no hesitation writing the president. <laughs> they, they all do, and they, they all speak up with passion. Um, they're all incredibly welcoming people, really friendly, everyone's very excited. Uh, Everyone thought Mary Sue did a great job, Mary Sue Coleman did a great job, but they were very anxious to meet the new guy and see what's next. So it's all, it's all good. Wonderful. So I guess that's going to bring us into our first topic. Uh, you mentioned, you know, even when people in the community have had criticism, they felt comfortable to bring that up. Something that we've seen recently, especially in the last few weeks, has been the controversy surrounding the university's athletic department. Your lunch with honors talk last week, sure. I think you mentioned something about, you know, everything seemed to be going great until you realized sports and football was a thing at the university. Yeah. So maybe could you talk about how and in what ways that might have served as a signal for some of the challenges that you might face as you headed into your presidency? So you know, that's interesting. So certainly coming into Michigan from the outside um, and growing up in the United States, you know, I was always aware of uh, Michigan athletics and its prominence and the famous basketball teams and the famous football teams and uh, the big football stadium and the, the iconic helmet and all those things I was aware of, um, but I didn't really appreciate until I lived through it the uh, incredible amount of passion that this provokes. Um, and in this particular set of episodes in recent months, that passion went beyond folks that read the sports page first every time uh, and went to people you know that are you know regular everyday alums across the full spectrum of, of what folks do are really interested in passionate athletics. So it got a huge amount of attention. And because of that, because it got so much attention that it became an aspect of how the university's reputation was being assessed and modified, then it became a really high priority for me very quickly. Because I wouldn't want all of the great work that the university as a whole does to be diminished by a, a misperception of what Michigan was all about uh, because of this hot button set of stories. So when you have this kind of controversy where maybe it might be impacting the brand at the university, you know, what kind of actions are necessary to take and what point does it become necessary to take action to ensure that the brand and the university's standing as an academic institution is not impacted? Yeah, you know, in that sense, this is no different than any other kind of issue. Is that when something uh, um, rises to the level of being first on the list instead of somewhere on the list, uh, the very first thing I do is try to learn as much about it as I can and try to separate the heat of the moment from the actual substance of what it is we're trying to learn about and then trying to accomplish. So try to get down to the meat. Um, and that was this case with athletics too, is it took some time uh, to really get past the newsworthy parts of it and dig down a little bit deeper into the, really the substance of what the issues are surrounding our athletics program. And it's not just Michigan, you know, we're 
visible and prominent and things happened that made us the front page story, but I think all serious universities that also have major athletic programs are struggling with the fit. You know, what is the right role of intercollegiate athletics at a big, serious university? And uh, uh, I just uh, ended up having to deal with that issue and uh, bring that to the top of the list more quickly than I would have otherwise because of the events of the fall. As you've dealt with some of these controversies, you know, what has this showed you about the way that the university functions, how it operates, how different relationships work between different units and varying aspects of the university? Yeah, that's very interesting. So, uh, certainly uh, it spoke, as we already have mentioned, uh, to the connectedness of our alumni community all around the country, because my goodness, this was a big alumni issue. Uh, it was a big student issue, but in some ways, strangely, even a bigger alumni issue in, in some ways. So that was interesting how connected the alumni are. That was a, a real-time lesson. Uh, another was reinforcing something I'd learned as I traveled around to visit the schools and colleges, and that is that Michigan's a very decentralized place. And each unit you know, has their own way of doing things and their own degree of insularity from other units, some more than others. And I think one of the things I noticed in athletics is you know, that it, like a school and college, was doing things its own way a bit and wasn't necessarily as integrated part of the whole as it might have been. And then some of that, I think, led to some of the issues on campus with students, for example. Dr. Schlissel, um, you mentioned how quickly athletics became a hot button yeah. issue for you. Um, and that pressure was mounting all, all throughout the last weeks. H had Dave Brandon not come to you to resign, did you have a backup plan, or did you have a course of action you were considering? Oh gosh, you know, so you know, hypotheticals are not something it's ever wise to deal with. I can tell you though that the AD and I first met before I ever got here because I know how um, big a deal athletics is at the university. Uh, I didn't realize how big, but I knew it was a big deal. Uh, we continued to meet like I do with all the people that report directly to me. So the AD reports directly to the university president. Our meetings grew more frequent as uh, controversies um, continued to bubble up, uh, and you know we had engaged, you know, really in um, thoughtful discussions about how all this had to change in order to make the university better. And the AD had actually begun making some of these changes. Um, and I think what happened is the controversy aspects weren't going away; they seemed to be piling on and in part driven by the media, but in part driven by the passions of our alums, the AD became the story. Instead of Michigan athletics being the story and our students and the, and the goodness that we want to achieve through working at the university. So I think that's what led the AD to realize that um, uh, it was time for him to step away for the good of the athletic program and the university as a whole. One of the bigger issues that happened last week was, I'm sure you saw MGO blog reporting um, emails Dave Brandon had yeah. sent to alumni, and you mentioned how how connected alumni are to this school. Yeah. Was that? Did you get the sense that that may have been a tipping point? You know, you know I'm, I can't really address the specifics of what the AD and I talked about in private, nor would I address for any of the other officers of the university. Um, but one thing I will say is, I expect you know, everybody that works for this public university. Uh, to treat the public with respect. That's a sort of condition of working at the university, uh, apart from the athletics. I think everybody uh, should be respectful uh, uh, to the public we serve. Now, one, one of your biggest duties this semester will be looking for a new athletic director. Can you give us a sense of how far you are in that process? Uh, not really, because it hasn't begun yet. So we've identified an outstanding interim. He's just getting settled in. Today's his first real work day in the office. Uh, he's meeting people. Um, you know, he'll be uh, um, integrating himself into the athletics program and forming his own opinions of strengths and weaknesses and challenges. He and I will be meeting on a regular basis, more regular than usual, because he's a new senior uh, uh, person at the university and working together to start the process of rebalancing the things I spoke about, you know, competitiveness and commercialism and academics and, and really excellence on the field, the way we treat our players, you know, that doesn't ever stop. Um, uh, I would imagine that we'll begin the process of organizing a search in the coming weeks. I can tell you with certainty, I haven't talked to anybody at all, no matter what you read in the media, 
about whether they're interested in a permanent position here. And I can tell you that the names I read about in the newspaper are people I've never heard of before. So it's hard to imagine that I've actually spoken to them. One of the things you mentioned Friday about potentially finding a, you know, a permanent replacement uh, is that it may not have to be someone with Michigan ties that you can learn how to be a you know, quote unquote Michigan man. Would you be comfortable, completely comfortable, if, if the next athletic director were someone from Brown and, and never, you know, had never interacted with you? <laughs> uh, so uh, the criteria that I use for all the positions at the university, and certainly the ones that are going to work directly with me, is, is one of excellence. Is the person really, really good and well suited for the job? Are they technically the right person? Do they have the right experience, knowledge base? Uh, sort of skill set, and then by value system, do they have the right values to do the job here at the university? Uh, so those are the real criteria. Uh, I think a person having had experience in Michigan here is a great thing. Uh, I can imagine that a person who has never had experience in Michigan, but it comes to football games very often, that might be a good thing. Or a person whose experience is completely somewhere else, uh, that can also be a good thing, right? Because when you bring people in, that think a little different, they challenge your presumptions about how you're doing things. And sometimes that process makes you do things better. I don't think Michigan has cornered the market on how to run intercollegiate athletics. So you know, I'm always open to the idea that someone from the outside might help us be even better. I just want to get the best person. You frequently mention this idea that there needs to be a balance between academics and athletics at this institution. With the accepting the resignation of Dave Brandon, do you see that this has been a signal moment in maybe shifting or restoring the balance? Yeah, I think it's probably more complicated than that. So I think uh, 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 Mr. Brandon, Dave, has become the poster child for a lot of things, but he's not the cause of a lot of things. So uh, all across the country, the major competitive national caliber athletic programs in the revenue generating sports have been shifting further and further in a commercial direction. Uh, we didn't invent that here in Michigan, nor did Dave Brandon. Um, so the reset um, that I think we all need to partake in, not just here at Michigan, but across the academy, um, goes beyond simply you know, um, uh, changing to a different athletic director. Some of these other issues that have been associated with the athletic department, in part, you know, such as sexual misconduct, transparency, some of these other broader issues that you'll have to confront in your yeah. presidency. You know, how does a cultural change or improving ties between the central administration and the athletic department hope to or aim to address some of these other issues? Yeah, so I'm a little confused by the question because um, sexual assault is a, a problem that reaches across the full breadth of the campus. It's not an athletics problem. It's a, you know, sort of societal problem that plays out in the university and many other places. Um, uh, to the extent that there are episodes that involve intercollegiate athletes, uh, those students should be treated like any other student. You know, they're not special. You're special and you're special. You don't get treated differently because you write for the Michigan Daily, nor should a student be treated differently uh, when they either are the target of a complaint or a complainant um, because they play basketball or something. Uh, so that should, should be uh, irrelevant. Uh, similarly, the issue of transparency. I think um, as a public institution and as an academic institution, universities usually run better when the senior leadership takes the time to solicit uh, ideas and opinions from the breadth of the community. And in our case, that breadth includes alumni and, and all the people that care about Michigan, but most certainly the students and the faculty and the staff. Uh, so my uh, goal for transparency is to make sure that uh, on issues that are really important to the community, uh, uh, the full community has the opportunity to weigh in, and that I do people the respect of explaining to them how I arrived at an important decision, and then we move forward together. Uh, uh, so I'll try my very best um, you know, to do that. I'm sure I won't do it perfectly, but. Uh, transparency doesn't mean that you reveal the contents of confidential proceedings. You know, there, there are things, for example, it comes up in sexual assault all the time. Um, 
you know, I'm never going to talk in public about the details of uh, an adjudication that was conducted sensitively and in private on an, on an accusation of assault. That's just not right. That's not transparency. Before we move into some of our other topics on the table, um, on Friday you mentioned that you supported or agreed with Dave Brandon's decision to submit his letter of resignation. Many groups, whether it be students, alumni, other folks at the university, such as Regents, may have also supported this decision or had been calling for some sort of visible change in the athletic department. Do you think those concerns have been placated or addressed with this uh, with this action, or there's more work to do? You know, well, first of all, there's always more work to do because we're never as good as we can get. And I think my answer a few minutes ago really said that the issues that athletics confronts uh, go beyond the identity of the athletic director. And I can also say in fairness, um, you must realize I've received huge numbers of emails and letters and you know, some of them you know, with language you never use and, <laughs> and others with more reasoned language. Uh, but I've actually also received a ton of letters expressing disappointment uh, from people that see the positives that the current athletic, uh, the previous, excuse me, athletic director was responsible for. Um, I'm supposed to speak tomorrow evening to the student athletes at the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, and I've met with them before to get their opinions. Uh, they really respected the focus on the student athlete that came during the administration of Mr. Brandon. So, you know, it is like nothing, in, uh, everything in life is a gray. It's, not, it's, it's almost never a black and white. Claire, would you like to head on to our next topic? Yeah, um, for a new topic. Um, last week, students protested in the Diag, the, um, Sec uh, universities handling of uh, sexual misconduct um, and they presented these kind of seven actions change that they would like the university to kind of address. How um, does the university plan to address these actions? Sure, so you know first of all uh, I actually think even when people are angry at me that getting up and showing passion is the right thing to do. I actually was impressed by the people that went to my lawn when they were upset about the direction of athletics. Uh, um, you know, impressed by people that developed the passion given how busy everybody is and all the stresses and commitments you already have. To take the time to show up and talk about something in public that they care about a lot. So I think that's really good. Um, the kinds of things that the students who were um, discussing their feelings about sexual assault and the way the university handles this uh, we're mentioning were all reasonable things to think about and discuss, some of which we're already doing, others of which we're thinking of doing, and so others we've thought of and I'm not sure we can do. Uh, but I think having that dialogue on an ongoing basis is really important, and I think we should keep doing it until there's never another sexual assault, which will mean we're going to be doing this forever, right? And you know, what we should be doing is our very best to educate our entire community about our current policies and programs and ways to prevent assault or to intervene when you think something bad might be about to happen or will happen in 10 or 15 minutes, you know, to teach the community how to step up and take care of one another. Um, we have to make sure that we have the very, very best policies and procedures surrounding uh, accusations of assault so things get uh, addressed uh, quickly, fairly, in a balanced way um, with respect to the, how challenging these circumstances always are for everybody involved, and that we make a commitment to keep trying to make our procedures better, and then a commitment to let people know how we're doing, to provide the data, the, the information about the reports and how they end up being adjudicated at the end, so that um, the community develops confidence that we're trying and continuing to try to improve with how we deal with this. The one thing I will object to, and which drives me a little nutty, is um, framing things as demands. I think that makes it really difficult to have discussions to end up in the right place. So you know, think of how you would feel if I came into the Michigan Daily office and placed 10 demands on you. This is what you're supposed you know, this isn't the way one works together in a community where we actually share goals. And then the real challenge is how do we figure out the quickest, smartest, most sensitive and balanced way to get to the goals we share. So the university prides itself on having one of the best 
policies in the nation um, regarding sexual uh, allegations of sexual assault. So what is it, why are students still protesting? Well, I would say even if we did have the best policies in the nation, which I think that's a tough claim to make, I think that if we knew of better policies, we would change ours to make them better. I think that's a better way to put it. Um, even if you've got the very best policies in place, uh, I think it's still important that everybody on campus understand exactly what those policies are, that folks that um, uh, want to raise a complaint aligned with these policies know how to do it. They feel comfortable, as comfortable as you can, raising a complaint, and that the process works exactly as you write it on a piece of paper. Because you could have the best uh, policies in the whole world and the system still can work poorly if the policies aren't implemented well. And that's education, training, um, uh, communications around uh, the campus. Um, so uh, even with the best policies, we still have to work hard. Is there one specific out of all the, you know, kind of actions that they suggested that's going to be the most challenging, you think, for the university to well, you know, I, I think there are two of them that are challenging, to be honest. Uh, one is uh, the uh, request, I'll say, uh, that um, fraternities and sororities place signs up in their houses. Um, this is a tough thing to target a specific subset of our community and tell them what they have to say to their guests in their private establishment. That's, that's just a tough one. Uh, it's not that I haven't already and will continue to speak to the organized fraternities and sororities as I do to other groups about this problem and brainstorm ways to make sure that uh, the risks are minimized approaching zero, but uh, that idea of forcing people to post specific signs, that, that sounds kind of difficult. Um, the other idea that's difficult, which I think uh, people will be disappointed to hear me say, is the survivors of assault uh, ask that they have the, in effect, the right to determine punishment, to determine expulsion. And I think that's way tougher. I think that the university has to retain the right to develop its policies and find ways to assure the safety of survivors, both the physical and the psychological safety of survivors, but to define what the university must do in hypothetical future circumstances is going to be a very tough one to deal with. Beyond these specific actions that the students requested, what are ways in general that the university can change kind of a campus culture um, of this, and what are specific factors that contribute to this kind of behavior on campus? Well, I wish it was just on campus. It's all through our society, and it's the way people treat each other. And we don't treat each other well, well enough. Uh, and I think it's a minority of people responsible for a majority of bad events. Um, and that's why I think education and efforts to actually use the community to protect the community might be the smartest way to go. These efforts to uh, teach people how, give people options on how to intervene because um, episodes on campus usually don't seem to happen when the participants were alone the entire time. There are always people around at some point in, in an engagement on campus. And uh, you know, stepping up to help one another as part of a community is probably one of the strategies that may work. Uh, another strategy will be um, you know, very serious, aggressive enforcement of our rules of behavior. And uh, uh, the deterrent effect, to an extent, of people knowing that if you do something that's inappropriate, you're going to be punished and likely punished severely. So it's the same way the court system is supposed to work. You know, we should uh, have great procedures on campus applied in a, um, a reasonable, quick time frame so that justice doesn't take very long, and applied fairly but with certainty so that you know, we can deter uh, bad behavior. Uh, I think there's more about education, too. I think there are really interesting, important discussions about the nature of consent and what consent means and what you can infer but what you really can't infer and how cautious you have to be uh, about making sure that um, both parties in any kind of physical relationship um, are willing participants and understand one another in that, in that set of actions. So there's a lot of work we can do to keep heading in the right direction.
Okay, and then my last question on this topic is just um, sexual misconduct was one of the policy areas that you highlighted as the three kind of policy areas that needed immediate attention. So socially oriented campus things, yeah. Yes, yeah. so what progress can you point to, um, to standing today um, addressing this issue? Yeah. You know, well, we've talked about some of these already that are in, in place. The Change It Up program, uh, which began, is a peer intervention program. Um, the It's On Us program that the students have taken on is another type of peer intervention program. Um, we are soon to release statistics for our last reporting period on how well or poorly we're doing in terms of minimizing the incidences of assault on campus and presenting numbers and that kind of transparency is important to hold ourselves to account. Um, uh, we uh, benefit by having um, SAPAC as a long-standing, incredibly knowledgeable group. And uh, uh, Holly, the woman who helped run SAPAC, is a national leader in this area. And she's out traveling around and learning best practices from other places. Um, so it continues. There's progress in a direction. I don't think we're, we're, we're not at a place yet where I can stop paying attention to this at all. I think we're going to go ahead and move into our final topic sure. for this afternoon. Um, that is uh, minority enrollment. Yeah. Um, which has been a large issue on campus, especially with our recent enrollment report, which showed that those numbers remain largely stagnant. Yeah. So, Claire, do you want to go ahead with the first question? Yeah. So, last week, um, actually the same day that students were uh, protesting on sexual misconduct, the student group, BAM, um, was protesting the university enrollment numbers that were released and that the um, minority enrollment was slightly decreased. Um, has the university kind of come to expect this type of frustration? Um, I think that despite major efforts over many years by a lot of people, and what I believe is a broad and honest commitment to diversifying the campus, we have not made the progress that we all expect and hold ourselves responsible for, so we're not close. Uh, what that means is that not only do we have to keep doing the things that we think are right, we have to look for new things to do and new people to help us. And so we have one brand new position, for example, uh, in, uh, a, a woman has been hired to be our enrollment manager. And although that sounds like a, a kind of funny name, it oversees both admission and financial aid. And the idea is to coordinate the activities of the admission office and the financial aid office so that we can reach all around the state and make sure that potential applicants to the university realize that we're actually a need-blind institution, just like Brown was a need-blind institution for in-state students. And if you come from a disadvantaged background, we will find a way for you to be able to afford to attend the university. And I think there are a lot of students whose families maybe are either not knowledgeable or a little bit afraid because they don't want to disappoint their kid and have them apply and get accepted. You imagine telling your kid, you know, you got into Michigan, good for you, but I can't send you there. And we have to get the message out that that's not the case. So I think we have to penetrate as deeply as we can into the talent pool and all strata of the economy all around the state. So I think that's an effort that the enrollment manager can help us with a ton. Um, then we need to work on other programs uh, that try completely different approaches uh, to uh, promoting applicants and getting applicants to say yes. Uh, the part about getting successful applicants to decide that they want to come to Michigan ties in with the whole campus climate issue. You know, we have to make this place a comfortable, welcoming, inclusive place for all students before we can have a hope of being as diverse as the society that we serve. And that's work that we uh, continue to do on campus with the inclusive language programs, with meetings that occur in the uh, residential groups as students move in. Uh, but it's really a, an ongoing effort to make this an inclusive, inviting place for people from all different kinds of backgrounds, places where people feel respected and, and comfortable regardless of where they come from. And I think that will contribute to increasing success in the future. And then I think we have to start thinking about pipeline programs. We have to think about ways to reach students, not just when they're applying to the university, but when they're in seventh grade. And just to give them the notion that, yeah, you know, it's not silly. You can aspire to come here. Why not you? and to work with them to make them both college ready and then knowledgeable about the game that you all won by applying to Michigan, you know, learning how to play. 
So there are lots of things. I think that the, the bottom line message is this is a problem that we're going to be dealing with for the rest of our time together, my time here, and we have to be relentless, we have to be open-minded, we have to be committed, and um, I have to let everyone on the campus know that I'm not going to stop pushing them until we're more <coughs> successful, and that may never happen, we're going to keep pushing. The BAM organization yeah. um, called for kind of a 10% rule that Texas has adopted. Um, is that something the university would consider? So that's really interesting. So what you're referring to is this, it's really otherwise known as admission in the local context. It's the top 10% of students from each graduating class is admissible to the university, and that's a notion of how to perhaps diversify. It hasn't worked so great in Texas yet. They're, they're struggling, and certainly California has this, and it didn't work at Berkeley when I was there. Berkeley is having exactly the same challenges we're having here, uh, and it requires a state law. So you know, none of those are things that our admission office can do by fiat. Uh, or at least by analogy with Texas, it would require a law. We might have to think about how to do it. Um, I'm not sure that's necessarily the answer. At least there isn't a strong evidence that that's the answer in the context of our laws here in the state. Um, the provost faculty com um, and com committee came up with uh, a set of recommendations for the university yep. to increase um, diversity. Uh, what are some policy initiatives that are going to be coming out of stemming from those recommendations? Sure. So that was actually one of the more thorough, insightful reports of its kind that I've seen. And what we're doing now, um, in collaboration with the provost office, is working through each of these recommendations, prioritizing them, costing them out, figuring out which ones we should work on first. And I hope that later in the semester, if I can focus on this, uh, or very early in the new semester, I, I really want to talk to the community as a whole about what's next and how we're going to follow up on that report. I think there are very good ideas. I think we have to end up with a president's level strategic plan to diversify the campus. And what that looks like and how we get there and who's going to be the soldiers and the marching orders for this uh, is what we're working on now. Uh, but I won't let much longer go by before I come and talk about it. And. Um my last couple questions, just when you see students protesting um, in the dive, what's your biggest takeaway as they're trying to enact um, change on campus? Well, the first is respect, as I said earlier, that you know they're taking their time and they're putting their their energy where their where their passion is, things they care about. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, I would want to know what it is they're concerned about, and do I understand it well enough to engage with them on it? And if I don't understand it, I sure better learn about it. Uh, and then uh, discuss with the appropriate folks that work with me to help run the university uh, what are the reasonable things we should be focusing on based on this group of passionate students. Now, protesters are not always right, you know, but the, the effectiveness of their protest is that they're getting us to consider an issue that they think is really important. And for me, I show the respect to that level of passion by considering the issue that they're putting on the table. So lastly, yeah. as we wrap up, you know, there's yeah. three issues that we've talked about. There are many that are on the table uh, for this institution and for your presidency. Uh, the first time we met this semester, we asked, you know, what kind of rubric would you want people to, to grade you on or to evaluate your performance as a president thus far? A hundred days in, you know, how has that rubric changed? You know, what are some of the accomplishments that you think have been impactful and where are some areas you'd like to oh, see? Oh gosh, more? you know, um, I don't think that I've changed the University of Michigan in a hundred days. I think a lot of what I've accomplished is um, beginning to climb the learning curve of understanding the University of Michigan, what its opportunities are, what its challenges are, how to think about the match between what we're good at and what society needs, uh, how to formulate the questions so that we have the right directions on these major uh, social type issues like sexual assault, alcohol abuse, uh, inclusiveness on campus. So I feel like I've um, almost successfully wrapped my hands around the major issues on campus uh, and are beginning to have more concrete discussions with the senior leaders about uh, how to sort of shift this uh, aircraft carrier and send things going in the right direction. Um, I think at the end of the day I, I want to eventually be known as the guy that came here and pushed hard on academic excellence, 
because I think there's no reason why this can't be the top public research university in the country. I actually think it's close enough that you can sort of see it and smell it. Uh, I think that socially we have work to do to make this a campus that does uh, honor to the energy and the positivity and the spirit of all the students that come here. I think there are issues that we can, and we've talked about them, continue to work on to take a place where smart, passionate people come for their coming of age, once in a lifetime experience, and make it best in class. Make it the, it's really good, but we can make it even better. Um, and I think we have to solve this problem of how to make sure this wonderful environment is accessible to students across the full breadth of our society. This talent is, is literally absolutely everywhere. Great. Well, that Good. concludes our 100 Days interview. Thank you so much for joining we us. Went by really fast. Yes. 100 Days and the interview. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor.